Favorite introduction so far. <laughs> Short and to the point. <laughs> Saves me time. I guess I have time for a little story now. Um, so I went for a y walk yesterday in this town. I find this town in some ways very different from my hometown in Austin, Texas, as you can imagine. But there are some ways that are very similar. For example, um, we saw this, this big bridge, and it was across one of the busiest streets that I have ever seen, right? And, um, and the, the guy I was walking with said, we should go and walk over. So we got up to the top of the bridge, and there was nobody on the bridge. <laughs> and then we looked down, and there were all these people crossing the street in the middle of the traffic. I said, I know that bridge in Austin, Texas, right? Um, and then I also noticed that, um, that there were trees all, all around. You know, you have this big city with these beautiful trees, and in Austin, we value the same thing. So um, I feel quite at home here. We also have lakes in Austin. This particular lake is called Lake Travis. It is 64 miles long, but now we're in, in um, drought, so um, we paddled all the stuff that had water in it, which is about 42 miles. And we were in these kayaks where you'd sit down and they were foot, foot powered. And during this talk, I was planning, or during this paddle, I was planning to talk about fear. And you can imagine if you're going to be paddling 42 miles, and some of this is going to be at night, well, you have cobras here, right? We have rattlesnakes, and rattlesnakes like the night. And in the middle of the night, we have to come, come off and you know, see some of these um, cliffs. Well, we have to find a place to camp, kind of climb up the cliffs with our tents and everything, where the rattlesnakes are and the scorpions are. So I was thinking a little bit about fear <laughs> during this uh, during this paddle, and I was planning the talk in my head. And I was thinking that fear is remarkable in ways, not only does it affect us personally, but it also places a mark on places. This is the Great Wall of China, and it's obviously motivated by fear. And if you think about it, you can actually see fear from space, that Great Wall of China. You can see fear from space. And if you think about it a little bit more, fear and discovery have always been closely intertwined, mostly because you have to overcome fear to discover. And if you think about fear and language, language creation, they've also been closely intertwined. So I thought, maybe I'll do a talk about language creation. And in fact, this past year, we had the first Elixir conference, and that's a language that I'm involved in, mainly from the marketing side. Um, Jose Valim is a very close friend. And um, he gave his keynote address, and it's the first time he'd ever given this talk. And it's one of the most powerful keynotes that I'd seen, and one of the most deeply personal talks that I've ever seen. He actually showed, most of the talk was, was showing commit logs. On this day, I committed this, I made this many commits, right? On this day, I made this many commits. And he showed a graph of the commit logs over time. And he pointed to the times that he was feeling good, and he pointed to the times that he was afraid. And when he was afraid, his productivity went down to zero. And I thought to myself, I can't write that talk because I've never created a language. I can't go into that much self-discovery. I don't have enough to say. Um, so I thought, where can I take this? And if you think about it, there are all kinds of books that are already, about, already out there about fear and creation. If you're an author, you know of fear is writer's block. If you're an artist, you know that, um, that when you're afraid, you can't create. So I thought, that's already been done. I can't really do a talk about fear and language creation. What I can tell you is about fear and language adoption. So over the course of my career, I've spent time in the development lab, time as a consultant, but also time in sales and marketing. And in fact, my current company does market research where I can make it better.com. And so I spend a lot of time around customers and people talking about adoption. And in fact, this has been true for quite a while. 
There was actually a guy named Jeffrey Moore back in 1991 who wrote a book called Crossing the Chasm. How many of you have ever seen this book or heard of it? A lot of you, right? It's a, it's a famous concept, and it's actually maybe the gold standard for technical marketing. This is something that we all have to understand and know if we're to get the best of ourselves as programmers because we're often caught between the place of um, politics and psychology, right? So politics meaning I don't want to adopt this new technology because maybe because I'm afraid for some kind of reason. And psychology because I can see that there's a better solution um, right over there somewhere. And this is basically the overall concept. Across the x-axis there is time, and across the y-axis is basically the number of new adopters. So when you release a new technology, um, the new users come trickling out. And then over a while, you pick up, over time, you start to pick up steam. And then um, as the technology nears the end of life, you pick up very few new users. And it's in the overall shape of a bell curve. And more labeled these different sections. You have the innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and the laggards. And there's a space between the innovators and the early adopters that's um, called the chasm. So in programming languages, we see this technology adoption curve over and over and over. We might not recognize it as such, and it definitely isn't as regular as you see right here. This looks like um, a sine wave, but what you actually see is basically um, some languages with, with a much larger adoption curve, some languages which, which are much steeper at the takeoff, and some languages that are much more shallow. And some of these things overlap, like Java and C Sharp came out at roughly the same time. They had very similar looking adoption curves. So if I'm at the beach and I'm looking at this and I'm surfing, um, I might be frustrated with the frequency of the waves. And if you think about it, there are all kinds of factors that impact technology adoption of new, new languages. The one that everybody thinks about first is the syntax. And in fact, it may be one of the things that has the most powerful impact initially. For example, when Java was adopted, it was um, immediately successful because it was based on what other syntax? C, C++, right? And C++ was adopted because it was based on what other language? In fact, we've had 20, 30 years of a C-style language because that syntax has been hard to displace. <coughs> but in fact, there are other factors that have a significant impact on adoption, like the typing structure, like the available libraries and what the libraries do, like the business problems that happened at the time. But if you think about it, against the backdrop of technology adoption, there's a much more powerful adoption curve. And it turns out that this one is much more regular than other adoption curves. This is the programming paradigm adoption curve. And it's much longer, much deeper, much more powerful, and much regular. You can almost set your clock by it. Every 20 years or so, the old paradigm breaks down. There's some kind of catalyst, and the new paradigm takes off. And there's a little bit of overlap, but not as much as you would expect to see. And because we're actually moving between one memory model and a new memory model, and I'm talking this, this kind of uh, or one mental model and a new mental model, and I'm really talking about the way that we conceive of code, the way that we understand code, this is a much more difficult nut to crack. So we're talking about the chasm between the early adopters and the early majority, and what it takes to move a language from one side to the other side. And um, if you're thinking about this kind of adoption, this is the adoption curve that this conference should be thinking about, because we're actually doing two adoptions at once, right? This is a functional language conference. And adoptions 
adoption curves for the language are important, and the adoption curve for the programming paradigm is important. And they're happening at the same time, and it's a very difficult nut to crack. And if I'm at some conferences, some people would ask me, why would I even care? Why would I even want to cross the chasm? I'm able to get a competitive advantage with my functional language. Why do I even care um, if, if the rest of the universe um, comes across with me? I'm happy, right? Well, with crossing the chasm, you get the political, the economic advantages. You get more people, tools, frameworks, um, conferences like this one um, become more powerful. And since those things are springing up, then all the things that we like as developers come with them, especially the beer. So, <coughs> at this point, I'd like to move from more to Tate. So most of what we've talked about so far is about crossing the chasm. But I want to talk about the role of fear in crossing the chasm. So, these are ideas that I've had over time that, have, that over the last three or four years that have, begin, that have begun to crystallize in my mind. So I want to talk about two different kinds of fear. The first type of fear is a paralyzing fear. Right? Now when I say paralyzing fear, these are probably the things that you think they are. All the things that make it difficult to adopt any, any piece of new technology, especially things like programming languages and programming paradigms, which are inherently difficult to adopt. So the paralyzing fear becomes wider, as it makes the chasm wider as it becomes greater. And these are the types of questions that you think they are. Um, is this language going to be abandoned? Because that happens with a lot of new languages. Am I going to be able to find developers for the language? What's it going to cost me? And the biggest factor in crossing this chasm is often the way that we approach crossing the chasm. The manager is thinking not just what does it take to move these three or four programmers working on this project across the chasm, but what does it take to retool my whole organization? So, when you start thinking about things in those terms, the chasm comes, goes from something that you can step across to something that is much, much greater, especially with programming languages that shift programming paradigms. And this is the new language graveyard. This is where languages go to die. <clears throat> so we also learn that this is where that that this also leads to longevity of some pretty interesting players on the on the right side of the chasm. Right? How many of you know any COBOL programmers? Wow, in the United States, every room and every hand in the room would, would almost be up, right? Um, there's still quite a bit of COBOL there. Um, how many of you know C++ developers? And of course, we're already, we're already in, in the Java world, even though these chasms have long have been cast, have been crossed 20 years ago, right? So there's still some paralyzing fear that are, that's keeping some people on the other side of the chasm. So, but when we go to when we change programming paradigms, the cycles are longer, the chasms are deeper. And that leads us, and, and so the paralyzing fear has a bigger and bigger impact. But what I'd like to talk about now is how we ever cross the chasm um, to begin with. And that has to do with another kind of fear. This is a motivating fear. Who can think in, of an example of a fear that motivated some language to cross the chasm. Mm -hmm. It's still a little bit early. I'll let you off this time. Next time, I'm going to be very patient. Okay? But basically, a motivating fear um, 
makes the chasm smaller. And in fact, um, the motivating fear can get so small that the chasm disappears entirely. And we see um, the masses rush across the chasm. <coughs> Here's an example. What's that? Yeah, C sharp. So what was the motivating fear that, uh, that got us? Yeah, yeah. So basically, um, I ha I'm going to get left behind if I don't cross the chasm. That's an excellent example, right? So um, let's talk about the chasm from Java to C++, right? So most of us, when we think about crossing the chasm, we think about technical issues. We think about that syntax, um, the memory management, garbage collection. But it's rarely technical features that get you across the chasm there's always some type of business motivation that moves you from one side of the chasm to the other. And in this case, um, when we talk about paralyzing fear, um, when we were moving from C++ to something else, and what were the candidates um, to replace C++? If you were looking at an object-oriented language that wasn't Java, what were you looking at probably? Small talk probably, right? If you were looking at a business language, what would you be looking at? Let's say Microsoft language. Yeah, Visual Basic or Smalltalk, either one of those could work, right? Um, but there was also a problem of bringing the hardware along with you, right? If you had committed to, um, to Unix or you had committed to Microsoft um, and you made a commitment to something else, you might, it might mean leaving all of your infrastructure behind. And that was just too much to stomach. But the motivating fear was a business fear called deployment. That seems like a small issue today, doesn't it? <coughs> How many of you remember the packet of diskettes that you got with, with Windows 95? Ten of them, right? How many of you remember installing that more than once? How many of you had to install that in a business? I had to do that, right? So do you guys recognize the thing in, in the United States, we had these metal roller skates that you kind of slap on to your sneakers. Um, so basically, we said that um, the deployment for Microsoft Windows was diskettes and roller skates, right? But it wasn't one system that you had to install those 10 things onto, right? Um, because you had nine registers in a store, and then maybe you had um, five different stores. So this problem became pretty massive. Right? And then, was Microsoft Windows stable? No. And what happened when you, you got a new release? I had to reinstall everything, right? So this is the backdrop of, the, of, the, um, of IT. This was the state of IT when it, when it became time to, um, to move to Java. Now, there were starting to be some um, deployment platforms that could use the, um, that could use the net but they weren't prevalent or reliable on the Windows side or um, in, in the business world on the OS2 side with IBM. So <coughs> we even had to multiply this by the number of services that you layered on top, right? It wasn't just Windows that you had to redeploy. It was your own application code that often had to re be recompiled and deployed again. It was the database manager, it was the land manager, and the communications manager if you had a three-tier solution. So you had fixed packs and a pack of diskettes for all those things, where you might be installing 40 different diskettes. And then, that took care of the Microsoft stuff, but what about all the stuff that came with it? So you had multiple vendors, and not all of them used the, um, used the tried and true IBM or Microsoft development processes. Um, there were all kinds of fragile techniques, like even screen scraping, where you would literally um, load some emulator software, and you would look for position 14 through 18 on line 7, and that was your value, and then you'd plug that in somewhere else, right? So this, this, these fragile techniques led to a lot of up, updates, and I was using a memory model that wasn't even protected from one system to the next, so things were inherently unstable. And you throw into all this unholy mix the idea that, um, that business users were starting to panic because IT couldn't handle all of this, and so they were behind. 
And then they started writing macros and spreadsheets and these, these um, visual basic applications with business users. And then when those got out of control, they went to IT and they said, help us. And IT got squashed under the weight of the deployment problem. And then comes Java and they say, hey, I don't have to deploy to the client. I can deploy to the internet. Right? I have this th magic thing called an applet. Well, no, 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 a servlet. <laughs> and I can deploy one time to the browser. And once I've deployed to the browser, that cuts my deployment problem by an order of magnitude. And suddenly, I can manage deploying to the servers. Right? So when people talk about the catalyst for Java, there were some things that made it interesting. But the business problem that was being dissolved, solved was deployment. And once the deployment problem was solved, then everybody, then it wasn't a chasm, it was a stampede to the other side. Right? So here we are. Java has crossed the chasm. How many of you are coding Java? Happily coding Java. A few hands still up. Yeah, you're brave. Um, you know, most people are looking around saying, yeah, my, my brother enjoys coding Java sometimes. <laughs> it's OK. You can like it. But we've got Java parked on the other side of the chasm. And this is a functional conference. So I'm going to assume that a lot of you would like to be on the other side of the problem with the language of your dreams. Right? What do we do? Is this ever going to happen? And then, so I know some of us have nightmares that um, maybe we have another 30 years, 30 more years of C++-like syntax. And it could happen. I mean, two of the things that could come across are, are Scala and JavaScript. But, um, but still, there are some pretty promising technologies out there. What do we have to do to cross the chasm? Well, if you think about this talk, it's a talk called fear. And what are my two kinds of fear? Motivating fear, and what's the other one? Yes. So what are the paralyzing fears today? <coughs> I told you I was going to be patient, and I'm going to be patient. What are the paralyzing fears that are keeping us on this side of the chasm? Support. support. Yeah, I've got a new language. Um, how am I going to support it? Right? What else? Talent. What's that? Talent. Yeah. How do I find new talent? What else? Ecosystem. Ecosystem. Yeah, community. Documentation. Right? Documentation. You can go on and on and on. Right? There are all these fears. We can recite them by heart because these... This is what our manager is telling us every single day, right? And maybe, and maybe here, it's not even your management. Maybe it's the management of the people um, across the ocean, right? So the paralyzing fears are the things that they always were, right? Their um, adoption, community, cost. Um, how are we going to cross the chasm? But I have a question for you. What's the best way to eat an elephant? <laughs> One bite at a time. Right? And I'm here to tell you that we don't have to cross the chasm in one big shot this time. Right? We don't have to cross the chasm in one big shot this time. It's different this time around. The motivating fears are so strong, and we'll get to those in a second, but the motivating fears are so strong that we just need to provide a little bit of incentive in a bunch of different, different areas to turn this, um, this chasm, this hesitance, to a motivating fear and a stampede. It's ready to happen. We are already primed. Okay. So the first concept that I want to talk about is building communities. Why would I list, so somebody mentioned that community in the ecosystem was something that was preventing us from crossing the chasm. 
Why would I say that building communities is easier now? Why would I put that on the other side of the ledger? Anybody have any theories? What's that? Social media, internet, right? So, Venkat and I are authors, right? We've actually um, reviewed each other's books and, and worked on books. Um, would it surprise you to hear that writing books is not as lucrative as it used to be? This surprises no one, right? And the reason is that there's so much information that's out there already, right? So if I'm going to write a book, I have to write a different kind of book today than I used to. I am um, actually going to admit something at a functional conference. My primary language is Ruby on Rails. Does that surprise you? I even heard some, some chuckling over here, and, and that's, that's um, well-deserved, I think. But there are some things about Ruby on Rails that, that are pretty cool. And one of the things that made it so popular so fast is the community that grew up around it. So who created the language? Matt, and where does he live? Who created Ruby on Rails? DHH, where does he live? Where did he start? Denmark, right. Um, who discovered Ruby in the United States? Where is he originally from? London or England. Um, and where does he live now? Dallas, Texas with me, right? Um, and then in the, in the committer team, who can name the continents that um, Rails or Ruby core committers are from? Asia? What else? United States? Basically everywhere but Antarctica and Australia, right? All of them. So this is a global development effort, always has been. Building community has never been easier. Does anybody want to challenge that assertion? So what's happening is we're starting to see languages explode at a rate that they never had before. Right? It's, you've never had more access to the people at the top of the food chain. People that are willing to help you um, and they're willing to establish their new language because they're after the community too. They're smart. Right? When you help motivated and gifted talent, then you get more contributors to the ecosystem. Language creators understand this. The good ones make it easy. The second thing that I want to talk about is the idea that when you cross the chasm, if you're looking at it from a distance, it looks, that everything, looks like everything happens at once. But that's not the way things happen. Things happen a little bit at a time. When we went from object-oriented technology or from procedural technology um, in languages like C and, um, and Pascal and um, Visual Basic, things like that, to object-oriented technology, it didn't happen all at once. There were some bridging languages that happened first. First, there was a, object, a pure object-oriented language that you could play with that never got, it, never got adopted. What was that language called? Smalltalk, right? And there were a couple other ones. But also, there were some languages with some, <coughs> with some object-oriented features, but they weren't fully object-oriented. There was one that was adopted by the United States military. Does anybody remember what that is? Um, Adder, right? Um, there was also a language that was created after C to teach us object-oriented, or to provide object-oriented programming on top of C. C++, right? How many of you were C programmers that became C++ programmers? Are there any? Oh, a lot of you. That's surprising. How many of you immediately wrote good object-oriented code? So what you had was not really C++. It was C++ minus minus, right? This was a bridging technology. This is what's happening today. If you look at the agenda yesterday, how many courses did you see on using object-oriented um, languages in a functional way? Vincat C Sharp course um, session. There was one on Ruby. There was one on um, Java. There was 
at least four or five, right? And for object-oriented developers using object-oriented technology in a more functional way, right? We're starting to learn what it means to be functional. We're starting to move those for loops, those explicit iterators into, um, into routines that handle that work for us. We're starting to move from, um, from imperative to declarative, right? And that will continue to happen, um, and we're starting to see ideas like closures being, uh, heck, closures are even in Java now, right? So last time we crossed the chasm, deployment was a big deal because deployment had all kinds of hardware connotations. Today, deployment is almost a solved problem. How many of you have worked with Heroku or AWS? And they are, there are all kinds of options for the Java virtual machine, right? Deployment today is a solved problem. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is the idea that even when you're working with one particular project, when you're not working corporate-wide, when you're working with one particular project, you don't have to eat the elephant all at once. What are some ways that you can start to use a functional language within one application? Let's say it's a web app. What are some ways that I can start to inject some functional languages? Ser services, right? Um, basically, so when, when people talk about Twitter, that's often held up as a, um, as a failure scenario for the Ruby programming language. I think it's a tremendous success story for the Ruby language. And in fact, I've built my company on Ruby on Rails specifically because I can iterate more quickly than my competition. But we're getting to a point where we know that we're acquiring the types of customers that are going to need us to scale beyond Ruby on Rails. So what we're doing is we're starting to build services, JSON services, pure web services, that we can, that we can access that do the most complex applications, or the, the most complex pieces of my application. This is a relatively easy thing um, for me to do. I can do this in, in bits and pieces because um, I have the same database driver um, and the same drivers to my queuing systems um, and, and my web, web um, systems, and, and JSON is rel relatively easy. How many of you write test cases in a different language than, um, than your primary development language? So that's what, about 5% um, of the room? This is a great way to inject um, something like a functional language. So there are all kinds of sessions at conferences like these about using more dynamic languages than Java, for example, Groovy, Groovy in a testing scenario. You can also use functional languages to accomplish very much the same thing. It's a great way to inject things like Scala because the extra abstractions give you more options than just simple stubbing and mocking. Right? So basically, my point is that interfaces are cleaner than they've ever been before, so two applications can talk, even two different elements of the same application can talk. And if you're running functional languages and the object-oriented language on the same virtual machine, then you can even have um, different pieces of the same application layer um, implemented in object-oriented and functional languages. Right? So next, I want to talk a little bit about motivating fears. What do you guys think the motivating fears are for moving from object-oriented languages to functional languages? Concurrency is a huge one, right? Concurrency will define this generation of developers. Do we solve it well, or do we not solve it well? That's the problem that we have to solve. Okay. What are some of the other problems? What's up? Can I say it is complexity? What's that? Time to market. Yes. Yes. 
Um, time to market is is um, a, a great way is is a great problem. Um, so the ones that I have, <coughs> if you look at every single paradigm shift in our history, I believe that complexity is always the first problem that we have to solve. I think that there's a reason that new programming paradigms emerge on such a regular schedule every 20 years or so. Right? I believe that the old systems can't can't scale up in terms of complexity. This is happening with object-oriented systems. It's actually been happening since 1990, um, since the 99 or 2000 or so, right? Um, how many of you have um, been to a session on Spring or Aspect J or any, anything like that? And so, so basically, these technologies are solving a binding problem where um, Java frameworks were forcing you to bind more quickly than you wanted to. They were also solving a structural problem of how to solve what, what's called cross-cutting concerns. Things like a person object or an employee object or a department object are easy to imagine with object-oriented technologies. Things like logging that cut across all of these concerns are less easy to imagine. So, there are places where the object-oriented paradigm is starting to break down. And in fact, if you think about the, the problem that we are solving most often, which is babysitting a big, fat relational database with a, with a web application, neither one of those problems are particularly good as object-oriented um, technologies. In fact, we've seen many, many attempts at object-oriented databases on the web, and they are on um, object-oriented databases, and Pretty much, they've all failed commercially. And if you look at if you look at traditional web applications, what is an HTTP request but a function? They can be synchronous or asynchronous, but they're basically functions. These are inherently um, functional problems, and we should um, bring functional problems or functional technologies to bear. I want to give you a couple of examples from um, from the Elixir community, which I've been involved in. Um, and from, from my latest book, which is Seven More Languages in Seven Weeks, um, to kind of um, show you a little bit of um, how we're starting to control complexity. So the Elixir language is interesting to me because it's really the first time that we've seen the application of macros with a rich and natural syntax. Does everybody buy that? So in closure, you have the concept that data is, um, is code. And in Elixir, we have something similar, but it's really the AST, the syntax tree, the abstract syntax tree is code. So you can use macros like this use statement in the upper right that, um, and these state statements, which, um, which expand to a bunch of different functions and, um, and data operations. So in this case, when I type use state machine, and then I, um, I implement these states, I get a very beautiful usage model, right? Where I could say uh, vidstore.rent my video, or vidstore.return my video, or take a video and then return it, and then rent it, and then lose it, right? And this is all because I have this, this beautiful macro-based API that's really serving as a bit bigger building block. And then I have some Elixir code behind the scenes that actually takes that code and builds out the syntax tree to do what I want it to. OK, so the second motivating fear that I want to talk about is multi-core. Now, how many of you were coding when, um, when Y2K happened? So a good chunk of you. Um, how many of you? thought that Y2K, um, Y2K happened the way that you expected it to. So I believe that multi-core and distribution is the real Y2K. There's a lot of broken um, Java, C, C Sharp, C++ code out there that right now is failing rarely, basically because there aren't enough cores to, um, to, to make the problem show up. But as we start seeing more sharing 
um, and more multi-core solutions. And as we have to start deploying those Java applications that are thread safe to these solutions, then the applications are going to break, or one of the frameworks that they're based on is going to break. Right? This is the issue that's going to define the generation, the programming generation of the people in this room. It's not just it's not just learning to, um, to program concurrency in a friendlier way. Um, it's about making applications that work, that we know work, from the top down because the language won't allow them to break. So here's another Elixir application. Um, the interesting thing about the Erlang model that Elixir is based on is that um, it gets two things right. The first one is process. So Elixir has lightweight processes so that Erlang developers and Elixir developers reach for a new process the way that you reach for a new object. You can actually have millions of processes um, on, on, a single, on a single system um, in today's hardware. And that will increase um, you know, exponentially as, um, as we throw more power at them. There's a system called OTP, which um, had some telephony um, acronym, Open Telephone Protocol or something like that. Does anybody remember? OK. So, but this framework has been generalized to support general distribution. Um, this is the Elixir version of a chat room. And what's interesting is that this solution, when deployed, will be completely monitorable, where the monitors have a completely different communication channel than the application code. And this is important because when things fail, and remember in Erlang, the motto is let it crash. But when things fail, we can let them crash, and then the monitor can take action on it. And what that means to you is that all of the boilerplate code to manage exceptions goes away. Right? That's all handled at the top level of the application where I don't necessarily need to care. So you don't see error checking here, but this can be a surprisingly reliable and robust application. But the problem with Erlang for writing things like this is that since there's no macros, there's not a reuse model for it. So that if I wanted to use do, um, <coughs> this kind of thing without macros, this is what the code would look like in Elixir. And if I wanted to expand that to the Erlang equivalent, it's really too big for me to show. Everybody's got in, in the Erlang community has an OTP code on their editor, which generates um, some 130 or one, uh, 130 or 140 lines of boilerplate code. So what I'm saying is that macros with the distribution model give us the capability to control that complexity by having um, actual code that writes the code so they don't have to work with a code generation type solution. By the way, what's the problem with a code generation solution with an Emacs um, key that does the work? What, what principle does it violate? Dry. <laughs> it's the absolute <laughs> nightmare for dry, right? <laughs> don't repeat yourself. Well, I didn't. I just pressed one key, right? I just repeated myself that one little time with 140 lines of code, right? So um, the DSL is from Dave Thomas. Um, the example is from Peter Minton. And um, there's a great article on it called Thinking in Elixir and Hiding Your Messages. And that, that basically expands things in more detail. If you're interested, you should check it out. So the last example that I want to bring to your attention is Elm. How many of you got to see the Elm session yesterday? Um, how many were impressed? It's radical, isn't it? So in seven languages in seven weeks, um, I wrote the first game that I've written in maybe 20 years. <laughs> when I was in high school, I used to write basic games for my spending money. You know, my neighbors were working at McDonald's, and I was writing games and kind of enjoying myself. Um, but I quit writing games because it used to be that systems were so slow that I could write a game by, um, by pre presenting something on the screen. And then it was so slow 
that it was time to present something on the screen again, right? There was no timing or anything like that. And then, uh, so that was with the IBM XT. And when the IBM AT came out, um, it was too fast. And I couldn't play any of my games, and I got frustrated, and I quit because I didn't want to work out all the interrupts and the timing and all that stuff. With Elm, the abstraction, um, Elm abstracts all of that away. It, it makes things like timers, um, like mouse positions, all of these things can be interpreted as, as signals, which is really um, a function that's mapped onto user input. Right? So that mouse X, for example, is the mouse position, the X part of the mouse position um, with at a point in time. Right? Or you could have window dimensions, which basically even as the window is, is um, resized, um, you get the um, absolute window dimensions. So that, for example, if I'm writing a game and I need to move a paddle around, what I write is essentially repeatable functions that are easy to test, like this. Somebody who has not seen Elm before, tell me what that draw a paddle function does. takes a filled black rectangle and does what? Moves it to some x coordinate and then moves it to some y coordinate. Right? And so this takes a shape which is piped to another shape which is piped to another shape. So we're basically transforming the same shape over and over. Right? And it returns a transformation um, of a paddle. Right? And the display function takes a collage and um, just presents one element, and that's, that's a paddle, right? And it uses draw paddle to, um, to present that paddle. And here's the magic at the bottom. So you have this lift to function, which means take two signals, which we call act like functions, right? One of those functions is the window's dimensions. One of those functions is the mouse exposition. And I'm going to lift those values at a point in time onto display. So now whenever the window dimensions or the mouse exposition changes, it's going to trigger this function and it's going to draw my paddle at a new location. That's wicked cool, right? So somebody asked, how many of you were at the fishbowl yesterday? So do you guys recall the question where somebody asked a great question about uh, about inherently stateful problems, right? Like user interface design. It's inherently stateful, right? Because what I'm doing is con consistently updating mouse positions, right? Or consistently updating window positions. But if you reimagine it a little bit and you say, hey, really, a mouse position is a function and the window position is a function and all you have to do is update when things change, right? then all of the update can be shoved to one tiny sliver of your application. And everything else is pure functional, and everything else can be tested as if it were pure functional, which means I don't have to worry about mutable state or anything like that. It's easy to test things in application. Databases work exactly the same way. If you think about, if you imagine databases in the right way, rather than updating a row in the database, you're always writing a new version to the database. Your value and a point in time. And if you want to return the latest value, that's fine. But you can return the value that's based on the needs of the application. Whether you want to, want to create a consistent view at a single point in time, or whether you want to, want to present the user the absolute latest, um, latest version. All right. So, this is why people say that, um, that you can dramatically control complexity with, um, with functional languages. So this is what it's going to take to move the elephant from the right side of the chasm to make some room for the languages that we all want to be writing in. Okay. Now in the past, I've gotten a lot of questions on this talk, and I'd encourage you to ask them now.
Surely you're curious. Yes. Oh, so the question is, is there ever a reason? And you're asking a guy with, um, with an early iPhone 5, and I had an iPhone 3 before I had an iPhone 5, um, that, that, hasn't, that never updates my um, OS software to the next major release. Um, I'm just, it works. <laughs> I've, I've updated before, and it's burned me. Um, so, so I just don't. So there are, there are many reasons to honor um, fear. <coughs> um, I don't mean to say that there aren't reasons. Um, but sometimes you have to honor the motivating fear as well, right? So I think that we're kind of in a, in a special time right now. Um, you, know, you, can, you can see me. I've been writing about functional languages since 2010, knowing that I was going to eventually need to move in that direction. But I've been staying pat until I found a language that, was, that I was really excited about and that had the DSL capabilities that I had with Ruby that I could read like a um, natural language, but, um, but where I could leave that processing model behind. And um, you know, I didn't move until I had one. So. Um, but I think that we're all going to be writing in a functional language um, three or four years from now. Maybe even uh, many people in this room will be writing in functional languages before then. Um, it's, it's just the... the the problems are too compelling. There's, there's, there, is, there really is a Y2K problem out there right now where um, I'm not going to be able to be competitive because, um, because my competitors will be able to take advantage of multi-core and I can't because they'll be working at a higher level of abstraction and I can't. Um, and, and things are really going to start to break. Um, I, I truly believe that. More questions? Yes. or could become mainstream is functional programming paradigm. Uh, but if you look at last decades or few decades back, there were other promising approaches, for example, like uh, aspect orientation. So uh, in future, what paradigm do you think has a, a potential to uh, you know, replace object orientation other than the functional orientation? OK, so the question is, what programming paradigms have the um, potential to replace object-oriented code um, other than functional programming? Um, so I believe, that's, that's an excellent question, by the way. I believe that programming paradigms don't happen overnight. I believe that a lot of groundwork has to happen first before a paradigm emerges. And if something, um, something else had, um, had, had emerged, then we would have seen it by now. And I think that there are really two um, primary contenders. And one is a hybrid approach something that you might see in Scala or OCaml. Um, those are very different, two very different versions of the same thing, right? Scala is more of, a, of an iterative bridging technology, much like C++ was. Um, and OCaml is more of an immutable um, way to do object orientation and pure functional. And of those two, I think that pure functional is going to let us unmake some mistakes that object, orienta or object orientation um, let us make. Actually, there's a third alternative, and I hesitate to mention it because I'm so afraid of it, um, and that's JavaScript. There's, there's a, a big push um, to JavaScript right now. I don't think it solves all the problems that it needs to solve, though. Did I answer your question? Uh, in, in the back corner here. I, I, can't, I can't hear. Um, Did, did we have a question over here? Yeah. Okay. Where are we? Okay. Okay. I still write a bunch of seek. Okay. Um, so have we ever, we have adopted new languages or new paradigms, but have we ever really left something behind or really moved on, right? We, even if you see today, there's a lot of C code being written, a lot of Java <coughs> code being written, a lot of JavaScript code being written, right? I think we are adopting new technologies, but th those are more for a domain fit, right? As a paradigm shift itself in the thought we are uh, solving problems, right? If you're going to solve something for kernel today, right? Uh, I don't see any other better language than C today. 
Yeah, so I, I think that there's a question or actually a comment built into a question that um, that will never fully leave object orientation Will we behind. ever do that? So. Yeah, yeah I, I, I completely agree with that. Um, in fact, um, I think that um, that th there was a question and a statement here that sometimes it's important to honor the fear, right? To honor the paralyzing fear. Um, basically, um, I didn't say that the paralyzing fears were irrational. They're actually very important. Um, but I do believe that there are some things that will move our business critical applications forward um, based on competitive pressures, uh, where hardware is going. I mean, our world economy is based on um, increasing um, hardware and increasing performance. And that can't happen. Basically, the hardware guys, when they started, when they stopped doing this with chips and they started doing this, when they started building up, they basically, um, said, not my problem anymore. Software guys, it's your problem. Now we're up, right? So I'm talking about line of business, um, the mission critical applications that will need to grow and need to scale. So great question, thank you. Um, next question? Yeah, uh, you talked about, uh, yeah. Where, where am I looking? Okay. Yeah, you talked about, uh, you know, crossing the chasm being never easier, uh, but, uh, one of the things is, if you look about the earlier chasms that were crossed, was there used to be one big problem and one major language that solved it. Now we have lots of potentially lots of problems being solved at the same time, and lots of potential languages, lots of languages wanting to solve those together. So even in your last slide, you had a whole number of languages, and each of them solved a different set of problems to a different extent. And uh, does the, do you think that is making crossing the chasm easier? and potentially con confusing more people in terms of, hey, there are so many new languages attempting to solve this, like, uh, uh, this particular chasm a little bit differently. I am not sure uh, you know, which wagon to hitch my uh, you know, ride with and making that a difficult and slowing down crossing the chasm. OK, um, so I think that there's a question and a statement. Let me see if I can summarize this. Um, so basically. The question or the statement is maybe um, we won't cross the chasm with a single language this time. Maybe we'll cross the chasm with multiple languages. Um, and let me make a deep personal confession that the best books that I write are written out of fear. <laughs> when I'm afraid, um, I, I step back and I examine um, what's going on. And, um, when I have an insight that I think is important, I try to push that out in the form of a book. I never expected Seven Languages to be a popular book. Um, I wrote it because I think I needed to do it. My, I needed to do it for myself. And apparently, enough of you um, were having the same fears and concerns that you were that you were, um, you know, basically made the book successful. And thank you. But basically, I wrote the book because I didn't know what the winner was going to be. Right? And that's usually not like, like, the, like me. Um, Venkat has seen me start to talk about Hibernate long before Hibernate was popular in spring and, um, and Ruby on Rails. I can generally see the winners as they emerge. It's, it's a blessing and a little bit of a curse too. Right? Um, I can't see what the winner is going to be, or even if there will be one true winner. My suspicion is that there will not be. And the reason is that is the same reason that we mentioned earlier. It is much easier to build community and thus much easier to build critical mass for two reasons. First, because we're talking about um, much, people being much more accessible, resources being much more accessible than they ever were before. right? And that's true for two reasons. First, because a lot of the languages that they were most interested in are open and not proprietary. Smalltalk, remember, was proprietary. The Digitalk license was very expensive, right? And the second reason is that we're not talking about a United States market anymore. This is a world market, right? And that means that languages, new languages are emerging in which the United States plays very little role or no role at all. And in fact, one of those languages is Elixir right now, right? where the lead developer is Jose. And Jose is from Poland, originally from Brazil. And the second committer is um, Eric Meadows Johnson, 
um, who lives um, in Sweden. Um, I actually met him for the first time in Stockholm. You know, we'd, we'd communicated a lot, and, um, and I met him for the first time this, uh, just, just very, very briefly, right? But the world market means it's much more easy to accumulate a smaller, a, a critical mass, and that um, basically because people are more accessible and the communities can be much smaller. And there's a larger, people of, of, um, larger group of people to draw from. So my intuition is that you can have a successful language um, because more people are, um, are available to help out and build the market. Sorry, um, I think the, the essential question, sorry, the essential question was, is the multiplicity of languages and different problems being solved, will that slow down crossing the chasm? Uh, will it slow down crossing the chasm? Um, I don't think so. I think that right now the um, the motivating fear is just get is is just going to be too hot. Um, so already the um, you can start to see um, when the, the 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 early adopters move, um, and and you start to pay attention when important people leave the room, right? Um, and and um, we have some personal acquaintances. Um, one of them is a guy named Stu Holloway. Um, he left the room a little while ago, moved to the closure community. Um, he moved from the Java community to the closure community. Um, Jose Vallum is, is a guy that, um, that wrote the authentication framework and the, um, and the integration to the web server for the Ruby on Rails community. Um, so he's left the room. So we're starting to see the cool cats leave the room from, from the object-oriented technologies. And that's making people pay attention. Um, so people are afraid, and that fear is starting to drive, um, drive people across the chasm. And when, when the leaders go, um, you know, there's, there's also there's a bigger um, pulling effect than, than there was before, especially vocal leaders from the object-oriented community. So excellent question, and thank you. Um, more questions? I think we'll have to cut it short. Uh, we Past the time, so thanks again for all the wonderful questions. Keep them coming through the day. Bruce is going to be around. Uh, thanks again, Bruce, for the wonderful keynote. Uh, big round of applause for Bruce. Thank you so much. <laughs>